Welcome to the grand reopening in 2024 of the Los Alamitos Museum. Shuttered now for over a year for interior repairs and for, well, basically a complete redo of the inside of the museum. I'm John Underwood for Los Al TV, happy to present some of those changes to you with, of course, the assistance of some very uh, familiar faces, some well-known docents uh, here at the museum who also will be inducting into the Los Alamitos Hall of Fame another of their many honorees. Let's go inside and catch the action. The Los Alamitos Museum's long-anticipated grand reopening and honored citizen induction ceremony on June 23rd was to begin at 2 p.m. sharp. But local residents and dignitaries were so anxious to get a peek inside the old firehouse turned museum that by 1.30 the place was packed and buzzing with museum members, city officials, well-wishers and their families. Out front at the main entrance to the museum, a short ribbon-cutting ceremony with longtime docents Marilyn Poe and Mert Parrish show doing the honors preceded the main event. By 2 p.m., inside it was standing room only. For over a year, the museum was closed for renovations. In that time, the inside adobe walls were treated and painted. The floor was resurfaced with an acrylic coating in fire engine red, of course, and a complete removal of all the relics, remnants, and remembrances of old Los Alamitas stored away and only recently laid out anew in a kind of chronological walk through the past as you enter the main double doors and proceed through time, as it were, from right to left around the spacious room. Hey, Bill. With display booths refurbished and repopulated in some cases with new artifacts, such as this case, provided and arranged by the local band of Gabrieleno Indians. As one of the oldest farming communities in Orange County, stretching back to Spanish land-grant days and before that, as densely occupied indigenous tribal lands, Los Alamitas clearly has a past to preserve. And since its transformation in 1975 from a volunteer firehouse, this museum has been the repository of all things Los Alamitos, including an honorary Hall of Fame dedicated to local, current, and past heroes of many stripes. One such honoree will be inducted into the Hall of Fame on this day. But first, current museum board president Debbie Kent directs the gathering inside the museum to their seats and commences the event with a short timeline of the renovations today. Okay, we're going to start. Um, welcome everybody. This is amazing. Um, I'm Debbie Kent and I am the president of the Los Alamitos Museum. Um, we're excited to celebrate the reopening of our museum and the induction of Joe Escalante into the museum's Hall of Fame. <laughs> Note that we have two city council members here, Shelley Hasselbrink and Emily Hibbard. If you could stand up. Thanks for being here. Um, this board, we're going to talk a little bit about the board first. This board is wonderful. We're all volunteers. Nobody gets paid. We're all volunteers, and it's a small board but we have become really good friends. Um, we also want to thank our City Works, who help us do and all the heavy lifting 
and putting things up on our walls because none of us should be on ladders. <laughs> <laughs> a year ago, we asked the city to get rid of the ugly carpet in here that had been in here since the beginning. And they said, have you seen the police department? And like Marilyn said, no, we haven't been arrested, so we have not seen the police department. But they said, we did the police department floor and redid the cement. And we said, ooh, that sounds good. So we started last end of June, beginning of July, we had to box everything up in this museum. Box it up. We started boxing it up, and it took, we were here Tuesdays and Thursdays, every, almost every Tuesday and Thursday. So we did that. The city came in one day and moved everything. We're talking the piano, the hose thing, the stove, the refrigerator. They took everything out, all the cases. They either went into the pods or to the warehouse. So just like everything, they did the floor, and then like when you start something at your house, they did the floor and we go, oh my gosh, the walls look awful. <laughs> you know, you got this brand new floor and the walls look awful, so they go, we'll paint the adobe. So they painted the walls for us. So we decided we wanted to do something, not just put things back in the display cases like they were, we wanted to do kind of a timeline. So when you come in, like when we're docents here, start with the flipboards, and then we start here, we go around. The Gabrielina Indians came and put, did the big one for us, so we're highlighting that. But if you go around the museum, when you come back here, it ends with um, the fir one of the first um, computers that was ever donated. So that's the end. But nothing could be done without our board members. Board members, I want you to stand up right now and, and all the docents, because we can't do this. We could not do this without you. So board members, stand up or raise your hand. And docents, any docents that are here, please stand up. Thank you. We survive by membership and donations. Very important. We're always looking for new docents. It's, if you're just a docent, it's one day, it's two hours a, a, a month, uh, either a Tuesday, Thursday, or a Sunday. Two to four, two hours a month. And you get to come in here, and usually they come with their best friends and they talk, and then they'll help people that come in here. Um, okay, so now I'm going to bring Marilyn Poe up, is Poe up here, our museum grand dame, <laughs> and she's going to talk about a little bit about the history. Thank you, Debbie. This is a very short version of the history because we want you to come back and take your time going through the museum. The area uh, began with the Gabrielino Indians and the display, like Debbie said, is over here. It was, this was all from a Rancho Las Alamitas grant, Mexican land grant. The name Los Alamitas means little cottonwood or poplars in Spanish. The city of Los Alamitas began with the building of the sugar beet factory at the end of Main, it was called Main Street then. It's late now, it's, it's Reagan Street. This included Felt's Market, and a lot of these, you see the pictures up here. There's Felt's Market. Uh, a, a general in Scott's, later it was called Scott's General Store. The Farmers and Merchants Bank, later called the Harmona Hotel, the Southern Pacific Railroad Station was here. I bet you never knew there was a railroad a depot here and a railroad station. We have some of the rails behind the museum. Once again, we got a call. They were digging up to build the, uh, the, the new lumber store. 
and they found these rails. And they called and said, do you want them? Absolutely we want them. They had to stop them on Catilla. They had to stop the traffic so they could bring them across. But they are now in the back by the water tower. And for those of you that wonder what the water tower is, well, originally this was a fire station. So the tower was there so they could dry the hoses after a fire. And we use it now for storage. <laughs> <laughs> um, there were also many rooming houses in, in the original Los Alamitas. Laurel School, the first school, with one teacher was built by the townspeople in the late summer of 1900 and available for instruction at the opening of the fall semester. This building existed for many more years. Sometimes it was the kindergarten and then it was still there even after the larger school. The area was mostly farms that grew the sugar beets and a few dairies. The story of the community continues to include the moving of Main Street to Los Alamitas Boulevard in 1935, and that was done by the state because Reagan Street ended at the sugar beet factory, and they wanted a street that went straight through to another community. About that same time, the, the, the community was subdivided, um, to the streets that we know now as Florista, Chestnut, Los Alamitas Boulevard, Serpentine, Pine, Green, Howard, and Farquhar. In 1943, the Los Alamitas Naval Station came to the area. This museum building was originally the volunteer fire station built in 1946 by the County of Orange. My father was actually one of the uh, volunteers here, and my son, who is here, and Donnie Sjostrom, uh, not Donnie Sjostrom, excuse me, Donnie Affling, they, he's here also. They were both members of the volunteer fire department. In 1976, the community had outgrown the station with the addition of Ross Moore to the, to the area, and a new one was built at the corner of Green and Howard with full-time firemen. That year, this building was dedicated as a community museum. The museum is dedicated to the history and stories of this community. We have a board of directors and faithful docents, as Debbie explained, and I'm gonna repeat this because it's important. We're open Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday from two to four. The history of the events are all on the flipboards right here, and it follows, as Debbie said, it follows the cases. We encourage anyone who would like to become interested in being a docent to contact us. It's really a lot of fun, and it only takes a couple of hours, so please do. And now we have Sharon, oh, Adrian. Hi, I'm going to speak a little bit about the Hall of Fame. So the Los Alamitos Museum has always honored individuals from the city who have achieved excellence in a variety of fields, from Olympic champions in sports to film, television, movie, radio, the arts, and other accomplishments of merit. The museum celebrates these special people by inducting them into our Hall of Fame, which if you haven't looked at, you need to go back there and take a look at it. Um, the recipients were either born here, worked here, or went to school here. Our city is also so fortunate to have hosted so many amazing inductees. Our Hall of Fame also displays and honors some of the pioneers of our city and their history. Please feel free to visit our Hall of Fame today and in the future. So today we have our special display of our newest Hall of Fame inductee. Please let me introduce you to Joe Escalani. Yes. <laughs> Should we give them the awards? 
Come on back. Um, I hope I don't butcher this. Anyway, I'm Sharon. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to read a little bit about Joe. Um, Joe was born in 1963 in an original Rossmore homeowner family of seven children. They lived on Silver Fox Road. Joe Escalani attended Mayflower Preschool, Rush Elementary, and Oak Junior High, and Los Alamitos High School, where he eventually uh, was inducted into the Griffin Alumni Hall of Fame. He received all his sacraments at St. Hed Hedwig's Catholic Church. Escalani went on to earn a bachelor's degree in Old Norse at UCLA before doing graduate work at the University of Reykjavik, Iceland. After graduating from Loyola Law School in 1992, Escalani took a job as a program and talent negotiator for the CBS television network. There he learned the TV business working on such shows as Rescue 911, Everyone Loves Raymond, and he, he actually convinced uh, Chuck Norris to sing his own theme song for the hit series Walker, Texas Ranger, which uh, Joe produced for the soundtrack. Uh, in 1996, Joe married his beautiful wife, Sandra, and together, yeah. And together they founded uh, Kung Fu Records, which became home to the early works of Blink-182 and the Ataris. Escalani's own band, The Vandals, also released eight of their 12 total albums on the label. The Vandals have toured all over the world, including appearances in Australia, Japan, Europe, the Coachella Valley Music and Art Festival, and for the U.S. troops in Iraq and Afghanistan in 2004 during Operation Iraqi Freedom. Uh, there's a picture back there. There's a picture in the Hall of Fame of him in, in with the troops. It's kind of cool. Check it out. Um, anyway, from 2006 to 2008, Southern California residents remember Joe as the morning drive time host on the FM radio station Indy 103.1 along with his sports reporter Timothy Oliphant and daily weather forecasts from avant-garde film director David Lynch. Okay, in 2015 Escalani landed his first TV writing job on the Discovery ID series, True Nightmares. After two seasons, Escalani joined the writing staff of the hit series, Ancient Aliens on the History Channel. In 2019, Escalani sold his own TV series, Monsters Across America, to the streaming platform, Fox Nation and eventually sold a second series to Fox, Alien Abductions with Abby Hornacek. As of 2024, both series can still be seen on the network. In 2023, Escalani's career path took a turn when an old friend named Eric Wilson, the bassist from the iconic band Sublime, woo, asked for some legal help. One thing led to another, and Joe managed to reunite Eric with the original Sublime drummer, Bud Gaw, and with Jacob Knoll, the now grandson of the deceased original singer, Bradley Knoll. This sent Escalani on his new path as a manager of Sublime, who now played major festivals around the world. Escalani now lives in his own town, Sill Beach. He teaches CCD at St. Peter Chanel in Hawaiian Gardens, and has always been grateful that his parents, Jackie and Conrad Escalani, chose Rossmore 
to raise their children in 1958. Wow. That's just a little bit of his bio, but you know, it's gonna be exciting to see what comes in the future with this man. It seems that the sky's the limit for him, and I really feel honored to be able to uh, even know him. This is cool. Anyway, okay, so we have uh, Adrian and me have something to present, and then we'll introduce you again. Okay, this is um, the Los Alamitos Area Chamber of Commerce. With, on the behalf of the Los Alamitos Museum, we'd like to give this to you, Joe. Congratulations. For being our honored citizen and for being able to join our Hall of Fame. There. Okay, so then Shelly. now Shelly. we have Shelley. Oh, wow, this is a packed house. I haven't seen it this crowded since the last Funko night. Um, so, you know what? I'm, I'm so proud of our city and that we have the heritage and the legacy in this town. Um, so I just want to thank the museum for having this. Um, it's, it doesn't um, go miss that their floor is fire engine red, and this was the volunteer fire So just really, just really proud of the city and all this history and its future. Uh, we have amazing things going on in the city and we're just thriving. Uh, you certainly don't live in La Salle for the affordable housing. <laughs> uh, so there's something else that brings people to live here, and it's people like you, it's the heritage, it's don't forget our, our where we came from. Um, so I would like to present uh, two, one to the museum for the Los Alamitos grand reopening, and then also one to Joe Escalante. Um, you know, we've had athletes and musicians, and now we have an attorney to say, we're diverse here at La Salle for our Hall of Fame. So, um, on behalf of the city, I would like to present both of you with these uh, accommodations. Joe Escalante, entertainment lawyer, media executive, record label president, film and television director, punk rock band leader, actor and devout Catholic and catechism instructor. Well, if that sounds like a lot to get your mind around, you're not alone. So we asked Joe to sit down with us just before his induction ceremony to try and explain how one person crams several lifetime careers into a life still in motion at 61 Museum years old. Here in Los Alamitos, and I'm, I'm talking with Joe right here, our, our honoree. And Joe, I, you know, I don't know where to begin with your bio. Uh, it runs all over the map. Uh, I, I don't know how I missed it over the, over the years, but you've been a local guy for a long time. You graduated from Los Alamitos High School, right? Yeah, I went to preschool right around the corner here. And uh, then over at Mayflower Preschool, and then Oak, or uh, Rush School when it was a, when the, when it was a school, Oak Junior High, Los Alamitos High School, UCLA, uh, Loyola Law School, and um, and uh, you know I spent my time in LA, and then I moved back here, uh, eventually like a lot of people do, and uh, ended up in uh, Old Town Seal Beach. I got to ask you, which came first? Now, Joe is a uh, founding member of a, a, a very popular punk rock group uh, from the 80s, 90s, even currently today, performing still. Um, and by the way, happens to have a law degree from Loyola, no less. And is, um, are you a practicing lawyer today? Well, I, I still have my law license and I kind of keep it... Uh, I keep my license, and then every once in a while, somebody needs some legal work, and I'm, uh, they'll give me a call. But mainly, I'm I'm doing some other other things like uh, uh, producing television, or right now I'm uh, spending most of my time managing the band uh, Sublime. From uh, really okay. From Long Beach, and this is a, uh, uh, you know, a band that that I recently was able to help put back together with the singer's uh, son. The original singer passed away in 19. 28 years ago, actually. And then his son is now 28 years old, 
and I was able to help put him together with the two original guys, Bud and Eric, and then this has become kind of a full-time job, so I put a pause on my, on my uh, other activities to uh, pay attention to this, because it's a, it's a whole new enterprise. And you're still taking the stage with your with your basically punk rock band, the Vandals. Uh, you're performing uh, currently, aren't you? Yeah, we're still performing. There's a lot of punk rock uh, festivals around the country, around the world, and we just got back from Japan. It, it's a, uh, a I uh, over the years we've noticed uh, you know people bring their kids, some people bring in their grandkids, you know, and they're introducing them to this music. And right now it's. I would say more popular than ever. I mean, we just played in front of about 30,000 people uh, in the Pomona uh, Fairgrounds a few weeks ago at a, uh, a giant festival of uh, this exactly the kind of punk rock that the Vandals play. And Sublime was also on that uh, festival as well. So that's kind of, um, they both go together sometimes. Uh and here today, you're being honored, well, I'm not really sure for what role precisely, but the many roles you have played over the years, and the many ways in which you've supported, well, the museum for one, that I know of, uh, because they speak highly of you as a supporter of the museum, uh, and, and a donor in many ways uh, to the museum, and today, as an inductee, how do you feel about this honor, I may be a small honor for you. To us, it's a big deal to have a, a personage like yourself who's been all over the entertainment map in so many different ways. Uh, how does it strike you, this, uh, this, this uh, inducted award today? Well, it's quite an honor. I mean, I remember when this was the, the town's fire station, and I remember seeing fire trucks coming in and out of this place when I was younger. And uh, I remember when it turned into a museum, and I thought, how, how great you know, for our town to have a museum and for them to honor me in, in this way is a thrill because, you know, I, I mean, people think, wow, you do this and you do that, but I don't do anything on a grand scale. Punk rock is very DIY. It's very under the radar. It's, it's, it's um, underground in many ways. My TV shows are on a small uh, streaming uh, network called Fox Nation. It might be one of the smallest streaming networks there, there is. Um, so, you know, I'm not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I'm not getting honored in the Oscars or the Emmys, but my hometown hasn't uh, forgot about me and they appreciate me and that means a lot. No, we have not forgotten you. Uh, you also have a radio show. I kept uh, an hour a week, or two hours a week of radio and, um, uh, because, I don't know, I was still, uh, I still had a job. So I've just been doing that on, uh, on KEIB uh, AM 1150 every Sunday at 5 to 7 and we talk about basically business affairs which was my job uh, for many years at CBS uh, television and later at uh, United Paramount Network um, so I'm if if there's anything in business that I'm ex an expert at it's business affairs in television a little bit of movie and a little bit of music but uh, we talk about it every Sunday on uh, uh, KEIB and uh, it's fun well we have we have just barely touched the surface, I assure you, of this man's renaissance life. But I can't let you go, Joe, until you, you answer one burning question in my mind. Do you still teach catechism classes at the local Catholic school in, in the area? Yeah, I'm a catechism teacher at St. Peter Chanel, which is just down the street in Hawaiian Gardens. I've been doing that about 12 years, maybe 13 years, uh, with my wife, Sandra. And, uh, you know, I went to catechism here in St. Hedwig, and I, uh, I want to uh, try to catechize the, the kids today better than I was, uh, you know, back in the 60s and the 70s. Um, uh, but, yeah, so a lot of people think that's strange, but I just have always been uh, a faithful Catholic, and I come from a strong Catholic background in my family. Uh, my father took us to St. Hedwig. Uh, every Sunday, and then at one point we, he started taking us to St. Isidore. Uh, so it's just very important to me, and when they asked me to teach, I never thought I could teach, but um, over at St. Peter Chanel, um, they teach so many classes there to adults, I'm always taking these classes. Then at some point I realized I know enough to teach to uh, little kids, so it's, it's uh, a big thrill for me, it's very important, and I love doing it. Given your vandals and your punk rock background, do you every once in a while slip in uh, a little Jack Black and School of Rock uh, catechism class to the kids? Come on. Well, I'll tell you something about the kids at, at, 
at uh, St. Peter Chanel, which is interesting because we're here in Los Alamitos, and you just drive, and then suddenly, bam, you're in Hawaiian Gardens, you know, and this is primarily Mexican-American neighborhood. It's a very humble uh, community, um, and the, my students there, I, I've been doing it for 13 years. Only two times in 13 years has a student uh, bothered to Google me to see what my background might be. And they say, hey, uh, Mr. Escalante, I, 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 I hear that you're in a band. And then I just go, shh, we're here to talk about our catechism. And uh, we're not here to talk about that. And then they, they, they shut up and they never bring it up again. That's only happened twice. They're just so humble. And that's why I like it over there. Just another aspect of Joe Escalante. You're a man of many, many seasons. And we're, but you're our man today here at the Los Alamitos Museum. We're happy to have you here, and congratulations on it, on the induction uh, into our Hall of Fame. Th this means a lot to us. We ha you have, uh, you are in good company. Uh, there are many, many, many individuals uh, have exemplified themselves in, in, in the acting profession, dancing, athletics, here we from, we do, yeah. Yeah, a couple I'm of. I'm more of a Generals fan, but then the Globetrotters, but. For today, I'm going to be a Globetrotter fan. We've got a couple of Golden Gloves, and, and we've got a, 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 a real plethora of, of people uh, in this Hall of Fame that Los Alamitos Museum honors one a year. you got to come and see it. I mean, this is it's a wonderful town, and you're going to be surprised at who's in here. As is the custom of the museum's Hall of Fame ceremony, the honoree is introduced by a friend, associate, or family member of the inductees choosing. Eminent songwriter and family member Paul Williams rose to present his friend and in-law by marriage to the gathered museum audience. Hi, I'm Joe's brother-in-law and uh, I'm looking to be on the, the receiving side of nepotism at this point in my life. So, My name is Paul Williams and I'm a singer and a songwriter and I'm Joe's... So Joe asked me if I would introduce him. He really doesn't need an introduction. You've heard of all the things he does. I can tell you a lot of stuff like that, but he's bought dinner several times and I've made a deal with him that I won't share all of that with you. But the fact is Joe and I have a creative connection that is pretty solid. Uh, most of us have, that, you know, have a, a life that we're enjoying or work as much as we are or vacation time or people that have had a combination of, of good fortune, of luck, you know, and, and talent and all. Uh, I think that, that probably a classic example of that would be with me when I met Joe's sister and in 2005 was smart enough, I was smart enough to marry her and lucky enough to get the Escalantes, Escalantes as my, as my, my in-laws and all. And they're an amazing collection. I mean, from a prosecuting attorney, there's, there is, you know, Joe and his, and incidentally his brother Greg probably did more for lowbrow art and for Latin art than anybody in this country. And, and uh, just a spectacular day so, so, I mean, Joe has, got, has gotten that close to getting me in a mosh pit. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm 83, I ain't getting in no much, no. but there's a part of me that goes, damn, you know, I know what I'm up to, and I know that, you know, you know, but Joe, and there's this, we're standing on ground, and, and I'm sorry I can't remember the name of, of, the, of the, the Toya, the, the, the amazing warrior princess who fought the Spaniards when they came. It's a big, a big piece of, of the history of the museum. Her name was Toya. Somebody here should know that yeah. with with at any rate there's Toy there's Purina. a there's a monument here oh, to Toy Purina. To, to, what is it? Toy Purina. Toy Valina? Toy Purina. Close enough, but the fact <laughs> is <laughs> But you know, I, in reading about her, it's like you know, all of a sudden you find somebody that jumps off the pages of history, you go, Oh my god, this is really important. This is a woman but you know, when, when, with the invasion of the Spaniards and all, who actually led a fight, you know, to to, to to protect the, the, the tribe, and, and it's, it's an amazing story. And I had no idea about it until I looked at what, so that's just a, that's 
a little, like a, a, a tiny little picture of what the the museum can offer. You you know you look around here and you find that there has been greatness through the ages and all, and it's perfect to add Joe to this and all. Joe's Joe's office is everything from a stage in front of the mosh pit. You know, to the bull ring, to uh, the head of, of, a, of, a, of a successful re a record company, uh, you know, and uh, and and uh, he and Sandra are fantastic hosts. It's an honor to introduce to you my brother-in-law and my dear friend, uh, and my my brother, my brother-in-law, but also feels sometimes like my brother, Joe Escalante. You got it. Okay. Paul Williams, man, can you believe it? This guy ended up in, uh, my sister called me one day and said, I want to introduce you to uh, my fiance. He's a singer and songwriter, his name is Paul Williams. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Talk, you're trying to explain to me who he is? And I was like, oh my God, now we have to be nice to you, Mariana. Is it her job from the Yeah. My favorite role is Virgil. The wise orangutan from the fifth planet of the earth. So, I mean, that is my brother-in-law. I, I actually made him a vandal sweatshirt and a Virgil. Yeah, we've exploited him. Anyway, um, thank you for thank you for all this, especially Adrian and Sharon, who uh, Sharon called me up one day and said, "Do you want to? We would like to honor you." And I'm like, "For what? I do all this, you know." Which which weird thing, you know? And then I thought it was probably one of my friends doing a prank, so I was just going along with it. And then, um, but she was very nice, and she brought me here to take a look at it. And um, you know, I said, uh, of course, I mean right away. You know, I'm uh, I'm not the kind of guy that's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Or I'm not getting an Oscar yet. Um, <laughs> but my hometown, it just feels like my my hometown hasn't forgotten about me. So I'm very grateful. Uh, so I think the best thing for me to do is uh, explain, like when you heard that bio, most people want to just think, this guy's crazy. How did he do all these things? Or it just doesn't make sense a lot. You hear something, that doesn't make sense. So I'll tell you what I do, what I do when I meet someone and they say, how, how, how did you end up this or that? Um, and then I explain it to them and usually I never get finished because they interrupt me or someone else does. So this time I can finish it actually. Um, but I'll start with the Los Alamitos part because that's you know a big part. That's where I ended up. You know we always end up. We just don't know you know fate what fate is going to do to you. But you, my parents you know chose this place uh, for some reason because Rossmore uh, was brand new and so we uh, they, they came from I think directly from Gardena and then you know our grandparents were in in Inglewood and they found this place and uh, here we are and I'm very grateful. Um, so. And then it's true, I went to the uh, Mayflower Preschool here. I started at another preschool uh, here, but there were bullies there. And, and, um, and I think they were from those carrier streets, actually. Yeah, right? So they saw the kid from Rossmore, they pounced on him. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I went to Oak, uh, or not, uh, Rush, when it was a school for seven years. Um, and I'm still friends with uh, uh, quite a few of those kids uh, today. And uh, Matt Johnson, yeah, right there is one of them. And then the then I went on to Oak Junior High, where I was an honorary member of the Oak Junior High Fishing Club, which still meets today. We're still meeting uh, um, uh, it, it, several times a month. Um, and uh, then, uh, you know, of course, uh, went off to Los Alamitos High School, and you know, I learned a little music while I was doing that. Um, Robin King, the music teacher at Oak, I know, at Rush, uh, taught, taught me to play the violin and the trumpet, and then I learned the drums at Oak Junior High, and that's where things started to go downhill. <laughs> because by the time I got to Mr. Herbacek's uh, marching band at La Salle, um, I had uh, switched to drums for the marching band because I wanted to save my lip for the, uh, the community orchestra, uh, Southeast Youth Symphony Orchestra, and I thought they were just like wearing out my lip in that marching band. So I, I switched to drums. He got furious and um, I quit that. And then I just ended up learning how to play the drums to Ramon's records. And then with my friends, we started a band. So we started a band. And um, oh, then I joined another band called The Vandals. It's already been going for a couple months. And it's just a hobby, 
Um, then I go off to college at UCLA, like a lot of people uh, from this area. And I'm going to be a lawyer probably. It doesn't matter what I'm going to major in, right, if you're going to be a lawyer. So I majored in Old Norse. And, you know, my Mexican father was not too happy about that. Um, and he didn't understand it, but, um, you know, it was, I don't know, I was just drawn to it. And then I went off to Iceland for graduate school, um, just a brief, you know, graduate program there, and uh, where I was in total immersion in Icelandic. So at one point I could, I could speak modern Icelandic as well as Old Norse, and uh, I was able to um, uh, study and function in that town. Uh, I mean Reykjavik uh, for a while, and today I think one of the, one of the, the most bizarre thing uh, about me to me is I'm listed as one of the notable alumni of the University of Reykjavik in Iceland <laughs> on, on their webpage. I just I can't believe it. I just love that. Uh, so um, in uh, but then you know I'm playing in this band, and then it, it, we had two K rock hits here in Los Angeles. We had number one hits. Um, we have this one uh, that says, I want to be a cowboy. Uh, it, it, it was like number one in, in a couple uh, markets. And then, then we put out another record. And I, and I wrote a song called Lady Killer, another number one record in all these markets. But in those days, there was no like machine that could turn you into a rock star from just a couple of hits. So um, I just, I realized this, this uh, oh, the third record came out and, and, and the, the, the K-Rock picked the wrong single in my mind. I could tell the future. The single they picked was not going to land me any kind of a career. It was just kind of a, a weird feeling I had. If they had picked something else, I could see it going somewhere. But I had a vision of the future. This isn't going anywhere. Um, and then I called Loyola Law School and got an application like the next day. I got my LSATs together, and it was time for the backup plan. Here was my plan. What did I love more than anything? Television. I loved watching television. I loved everything about it. And I wanted to work in TV, but I didn't know how you do it. I, I knew there was a guy named Frank Wells who was president of Warner Studios, and he was a lawyer. So I thought if I went to law school, I could be like him and work my way up or whatever. So I, I got a, an internship at, at CBS Television. I ended up with a job offer there. And I stayed there, uh, like uh, the bio said, I worked on uh, Walker, Texas Ranger, and uh, Rescue 911, and Everybody Loves Raymond, and it was super fun. But I kind of peaked too early in the television world, and I got a little, they, they just promoted me to some boring job to, of, uh, that was you know, not really getting into the business of producing television. So I um, took the advice of some of my friends, and I started a record label. And I quit that job, and Sandra and I started a label, and it did quite well. So that's how I went from you know TV network to all of a sudden owning a record label. Uh, while I was there, I never stopped producing um, videos, or um, we, we did a couple movies, we did a TV uh, uh, series for early internet network. Um, and then after a, it was about 20 years, um, uh, we sold the label, because I wanted to go back into television. And that was, uh, I guess, about 20, yeah, 2017. And then as uh, I got into television in the business arena, I started uh, uh, looking at the movie scripts that I was developing in a business, on the business side of things. And I was starting to see these TV, these movies that were getting made were so badly written, I asked my partner if I could write one. And he said, sure, you write one. So I wrote one, and it was, um, the first person I showed it to gave me a job uh, starting the very next day at the Discovery ID Network writing for a true crime series called uh, True Nightmares. So now I'm a TV writer, all right? So that's not that weird. I just bounced from here to there. And I'm a TV writer. After I'm there for a couple seasons, I had the uh, nerve to call Ancient Aliens on the History Network and say, I think I um, deserve uh, an interview. So I got in there somehow and they interviewed me. They hired me there. I worked there for f four years, um, writing episodes for that. And then I ended up uh, selling my own series to Fox Nation, and then now I've you know, started a production company making uh, my own programs. And all of the while, the Vandals are always playing, but never too serious. 
Um, just, you know, releasing records, not that hard to do that and have some kind of other job. And, you know, for a while the job is running a label, then the job is producing television, and we just kind of kept it going. And then, uh, a uh, crazy thing happened. This guy, Eric Wilson from Sublime, called me for some legal help. Now, I don't like to do legal work, and I try to avoid it. But every once in a while, someone will, will call me, and I'll do it. And uh, this time, I was, I was really rewarded because I found out that um, uh, the son, not the grandson, but the son of the original uh, Jacob uh, Bradley Knoll, the singer of Sublime, who sold 17 million uh, records um, he, before uh, Bradley died at, at age 28, right before they released their, their biggest selling record. And so that band never really got to enjoy the success that they, ha that they deserved and they created with these you know, hit songs that everybody knows today. Uh, so when I talked to the grandfather of the guy who's now the singer, he told me, you gotta hear my grandson sing like a good grandpa would. Grandpa, I'm trying to talk to him about some business stuff for Eric, and he says, have you heard my grandson sing? And I said, I uh, haven't, but when I did, I got chills. And I called my friend who owns uh, Coachella a Music Festival, and I played it for him. And he said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to put him on Coachella. And, I mean, we're, we're, we're making deals. We haven't even talked to the band. We haven't, even decided, we haven't even talked to them if they thought this was a good idea. We were just, like, making this big master plan for Sublime. And he goes, I will do it. I'm going to put him on a Saturday night at Coachella, and they're going to be huge. But, Joe, you have to manage them. Oh my gosh, I'm just like, you know, I'm trying to get my TV series reordered, and I just, I'm, I, I'm, I've never managed a band. But he said I could do it, and it would just be him and me making these deals, you know, and, and we, uh, so I said yes, I talked to everyone in the band, we put the band together, then um, everybody, you know, was, was liking it. I got a partner, I have a partner named Kevin Zinger, who was already managing the kid, and uh, we ended up taking over all their assets, all their, uh, their publishing, their, uh, their record uh, royalties, their uh, merchandise, their movie, they have a movie filming this, this uh, uh, summer, or this fall. And uh, it became a full-time job. I had to put my TV stuff on hold. So that is how I ended up as being a manager. So is it, are you following it? It's not that weird, <laughs> really. It's not that weird, it's just, um, you know, trying to avoid legal work, I guess, is my, is my career. And I think I've done a, a pretty good job of that. But you also, I, I also have a lot of respect for the legal profession. And it's very hard work. And if someone asks me to do something or a friend, uh, it pays off to just do it and do it for the friend. Now, other things, now to clear up a couple other things you might see in that exhibit over there. And trust me, that exhibit is, not, is temporary. It's not like, you know, the guy from the Globetrotters has this little sp space and and Joe Escalante has a whole wing. Um, <laughs> so I need that bass back. Basically. So uh, a couple other things that are weird over there you might see is uh, me in a, uh, a, what looks like I'm fighting a bull or something in Mexico or something. Now, um, that's exactly what it is. I'm, I'm, about to, I'm about to kill a bull in Mexico. <laughs> now, I, I got into that um, because my, my father, uh, took us to the bullfights um, quite frequently, every season. We drive to Tijuana, and back then you could get there 90 minutes. And uh, so I grew up with this, uh, what they call an aficion, for uh, bullfighting. When I got, but then it went away. Like, I don't know if you guys remember uh, the older people, like in the 1950s, you would hear about bullfighting all the time. Celebrities would be down in Tijuana. Um, uh, Ernest Hemingway would be in Cuba. And they'd all be watching bullfights. And then at one point, it just became the, like the worst, you know, thing in the world to, to most of the people. And um, they actually passed a law in California where you cannot promote a bullfight. And that law still exists. So they, they, they took it off the TV. My father uh, was always watching these bullfights uh, on TV, and I watched them with him. Uh, and now, and, and then, so it kind of disappeared. And now how it came back into my life was the internet uh, was you know, it created, and I got the internet, Sandra and I got it in like 1996 and 97 in our, uh, our UCLA student housing that we were living in, because we were, you know, we fell in love at UCLA. Yeah. We both went to UCLA, but she went 11 years uh, later. Uh, 
So, so the first thing I did when the internet showed up was I, I typed in bullfight. And uh, what came up? It's the first thing that came up was something called bullfightschool.com. And I go, oh, look at this. I think I can. People thought I was a jerk before. Wait till they get a, wait till they get a load of Joe Scalante the Matador. And, and I went there, and it was super fun, and I learned a lot, and I, you know, I was reconnecting with my youth and my father. And I, my father was still alive then, and I got to show him uh, pictures of me with little animals, because um, uh, you start with little animals. And uh, first, he gave me, his advice was, that's, that's really good, but you gotta quit right now. <laughs> and that was good advice, because the, the bigger you get in the bullfight world, pretty soon, uh, you're just probably gonna die if you're, you know, unless you're, you're, you're really good at it. So I, um, I think that explains that. It could happen to anybody, right? It's not that weird. <laughs> San, I mean, the bullfight school's down in San Diego. It's easy, it was cheap, um, it was fun. Um, but it is a young man's uh, game, so it's, I'm not really doing it right now. And um, <laughs> if anyone in Hollywood asks me if I am involved in bullfighting, I will, I will never uh, admit that. So this conversation didn't take place. A lot, n none of the people I've ever worked with subscribe to the Los Alamitos uh, cable access uh, program, too. <laughs> it's a true story. Um, OK, so maybe one other thing that people uh, ask me about back there is, uh, what, what, what are you doing with that priest? Uh, um, and then uh, I got interviewed here earlier by the TV channel. Says that, OK, this is all something, but there's no way you're a, a catechism teacher. And um, yeah, definitely, uh, my wife and I teach catechism over at St. Peter Chanel over there. Um, they probably wouldn't let me teach at St. Hedwig. Um, but at some point, um, my sister Diane said, you gotta go to St. Peter Chanel, you gotta check it out. And we know Hawaiian Gardens uh, for the tacos, and the pawboys, uh, and the, the uh, trampolines that they had, and the, uh, the go-karts, the miniature golf. I mean, that was where we went for fun and great food. And then before it got dark, we would get right back over here to watch. <laughs> so, um, but my sister said there's a great church over there, and so I uh, and they had adoration. That was a big thing that, uh, that was just kind of they weren't having it St. Edward. So I went over there, and um, I had my, my nephew Kyle was going was taking classes there at 7 a.m. and he was in, in high school, and so I go if, if, if and he lived in Coto de Casa. So if someone can if a if a high school kid will wake up early enough. You go take a class at St. Peter Chanel at 7 in the morning. Wow. There's got to be something to it. So I went over there, and I, uh, would, uh, my wife would go, like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. I'd be driving from Hollywood, uh, and I'd take this class because I knew there was something to it. And, it, and uh, we ended up um, uh, you know, just going there every week, and then we moved back down here, um, and then we made it our parish. But I still go to St. Hedwig every Saturday with my sisters, and um, yeah, I like it there. But, um, you know, I'm kind of over here. And then I, 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 I took so many of those classes, at one point they said, you can, you can teach. I never thought that would happen to me, you know? <laughs> and then so, but Sandra and I uh, do it, and we love it. And um, uh, so I'm a catechism teacher. That's not that weird, really, now that I explain it, right? <laughs> but I don't have any, um, I don't have any way to explain this to, to, to just people on a one-on-one -on -one basis, because there's too much going on, I realize it. Have I left anything out, Sandra? Anyone? Yeah. Funeral, uh, oh yeah, I do all the funerals over there. I'm the altar boy. So then, when you see me, when you see me over there, the pictures of me is me being an altar boy at a funeral. So um, I do it. I do it every funeral at St. Peter Chanel because one time I found out that uh, that the, the altar boys don't show up for the funerals, and I thought that was terrible. And the priests are on their own, so I go, ah, I'll do. Them. They go, okay, what kind of weirdo are you? And it's not like I'm a goth or anything. I just thought that was something that was needed. I'm going to go to Mass anyway. Why not sit there and, and be the altar boy? And it goes by faster. So um, I, I was an altar boy at one uh, Mass at St. Hedwig for Father Tran and for our friend Dorothy. Uh, and so the, at St. Hedwig, they make you wear the outfit. At St. Peter Chanel, I'm wearing what this um, but uh, so I got a picture of me in the in the altar boy outfit with Father Tran. So of course I, uh, I put that back there to make me look cold. Uh, but so not that weird, right? Not that weird. Okay. Uh, oh, my guitar's up there. Um, that's I, I left the strap on it because I wanted it to look like uh, I just I, you know this guy. Um, 
Most, most guitars in museums are not the ones they play, right? No one's giving the guitar that they really play to the museum. They just like, get a free one that they never use and they put it there. I wanted that one to look like I just got off stage playing it. And I really did. On June 8th, uh, the band was, I played that bass in front of about 30,000 punkers uh, and, uh, and sons and grandsons and granddaughters of punkers um, at the Pomona uh, Fairgrounds uh, at the No Values Festival. So it's, I need a back at some point. But, um, but yeah, so that's the bass I play. Uh, there's a, oh yeah, there's a picture of me and the band and some troops in Iraq. Um, that was my wife's fault. She, uh, she found out that a friend of hers was the tour manager for some, uh, a band that was uh, going to, with playing in Iraq for the troops. And she told him, my husband would like to go into the war and play in front of it. Can he do it too? And it was so dangerous, our drummer wouldn't even go. We have this famous drummer named Josh Freeze, and he goes, I'm way too valuable to, to uh, risk my life over in the war. And this is the, the, the worst time of the uh, Iraqi freedom uh, uh, war. And, and so, but my wife volunteered me for that, but that was pretty nice. Um, all right, I think, that, I think we're kind of uh, going to wrap it up. Um, can, I, can I say one thing? I'm going to open it up for questions. Paul Williams has a question. I know I'm no, I have no questions. I have to say something. When you listen to this litany, I mean, this amazing, you know, you know one level up to, up to another level, to another level, to another genre, to another, up, up, when you listen to all this, he makes it sound so easy. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, they're, they're, and it's, it's kind of an Escalante thing. They just, you know, but the fact is, at every level, each of those things that he's mentioned, I have been up close and personal with all those worlds, most of them anyway. Not bullfighting, but, but you know, they're all incredibly difficult. They're incredibly difficult to get a toe in, but to excel at it and to find that you're going to take it and use it in, in, in a fashion where your own kindness takes you to the place where you were given an opportunity to rise higher. It says that his spiritual life that he talks about is a large part of his success. I think there's a great life lesson in, in Joe Escalante's story, and I wanted to point that out right now. I'm really proud of it. Yeah, I must have done something right. My sister Mariana, she joined us when... I was a baby. There's a picture out there with... A, with um, so I, 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 I want to close by just uh, encouraging everybody to uh, uh, enjoy this museum. And if you grew up here, you're very lucky. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Joe has brought in a taco truck for us. So if you're hungry and you would like tacos, which nothing's better than a taco, we know that. There's drinks out there, there's tacos. Enjoy yourself, please check out the museum or come back when, it's, when you want to in July. So thank you very much. The doors of the Los Alamitos Museum swing open once again, beginning July 7, 2024, and are open for public viewing every Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday from 2 to 4. They will welcome you with in-person docents at the door and probably encourage you to join the museum family and maybe even become a docent yourself. There are few better ways to serve our city than to participate in the preservation of its rich history. For Los Al TV, I'm John Underwood.